Let me see. see you. <laughs> oh, 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 I didn't. Hold on. Good to see you. Good to see you too. -A -S. Good afternoon. Oh. Can you hear me? All right, good, good. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the Center for African American Studies, we'd like to welcome you to um, our conversation series. Uh, so much is going on in the center and here at Princeton. Uh, on Monday, we have an extraordinary uh, event on race and public policy that we invite all of you to come and attend. Uh, just last evening, we had our James Baldwin lecture with uh, Professor Paul Lansky. And all the while, we're doing work on the ground trying to impact urban education reform, trying to deal with questions of environmental justice, uh, trying to deal with questions around prisons, and teaching classes like they've never been taught before. The center's doing big things, big things. Now, it's my task to introduce two extraordinary people. Now, how does one begin to describe Donna Brazil? Mm. No language, no language. Yeah, I know. It's no <laughs> She embodies the style, mm -hmm. uh, the sweetness, and the swag of her native New Orleans. Uh, she's a veteran democratic political strategist, adjunct professor at Georgetown University, author, syndicated columnist, television political commentator, and currently the interim chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee, the first woman to ever hold that position. She began her political career at the age of nine. Oh. It's in her blood, it's capillary. Uh, when she worked to elect a city council candidate who had promised to build a playground in her neighborhood. <laughs> the candidate won and the swing sets were installed and a lifelong passion for political progress uh, was ignited. Four decades and innumerable state and local campaigns later, Ms. Brazil has worked on every presidential campaign from 1976 through 2000 when she served as a campaign manager for former Vice President Al Gore, becoming the first African-American woman to, ma to, to, to manage a presidential campaign. She's the author, and you all need to go get this if you don't have it. It's an extraordinary book. She's the author of the best-selling memoir, Cooking with Grease. Mm. Don't you love that? <laughs> Cooking with Greece, Stirring the Pots in American Politics. She's the founder and manager, managing director of Brazil and Associates LLC, a general consulting grassroots advocacy and training firm based in Washington, D.C. She's a syndicated newspaper columnist for United Media. We read her in Ms. Magazine and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, and we witness her brilliance on CNN, yes? Yeah, ABC, yes, where she indeed, regularly indeed. appears on This Week with Christiane Amanpour. She's an extraordinary mind and a courageous advocate for the least of these. We are delighted that she's blessing Princeton with her presence today. And we have, we're delighted that you've taken the time out of your busy schedule to join us in this conversation. Today, Ms. Brazil, you are joined on this stage by the preeminent public intellectual of our times. You notice I didn't say black public intellectual. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I said no, the preeminent no. public intellectual of our times. He stands in the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of those freedom fighters who risked everything on behalf of the most vulnerable in this world. Indeed, Professor Cornell West brings to his calling of bearing witness to the truth the conviction of his Christian commitment. He is a blues man in the life of the mind, a jazz virtuoso in the arena of ideas, and a champion for racial justice. In fact, he's a champion for justice. Cornell West is the class of 1943 university professor in the Center for African American Studies at Princeton. He's the author of the best-selling contemporary classic, Race Matters, but that book stands alongside Prophesied Deliverance. If you didn't know what that, you need to read that one. Prophesied Deliverance, American Evasion of Philosophy, The Ethical Dimensions of Marxism, Keeping Faith, Democracy Matters. I can go on because there are 19 books and 13 edited volumes. We were just blessed with his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. There he gives us a sense of the source from which his compassion and commitment springs. Family, love, faith, serv service drip from every page. His influence extends beyond these academic walls. From radio to TV to theater, on CDs and popular print, we encounter his distinctive intellectual voice and his ferocious moral vision. I'm blessed to call him my colleague and to witness firsthand his enveloping love ethic. I have the honor of presenting to you Dr. Cornell West and Donna Brazil. Thank you.
Good evening, Dr. West. It's a blessing to have you here, I tell you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. Indeed, indeed. And this brother, he had some generous words for both of us, didn't he? Uh, thank you for your generous yes. introduction. It was good to see a younger generation on fire like that, you know. He's from Moss Point, Mississippi. Oh, that's a Not connection. far from my hometown, yeah. I-1049. You can get there in about 35 minutes. It's crawfish season. The two of us right now could be... You know what we say in Louisiana? Sucking head and pinching tail. <laughs> Sucking head and pinching tail. <laughs> we, we have four oh, seasons yeah. in Louisiana, for oh, those really? of you who are not familiar with our great culture. And BP tried to destroy at least two of those seasons. We have crawfish, Ooh. shrimp, crab, and oyster. And so it is a great pleasure to be up here on your wonderful campus and to be surrounded by so many good people. So thank you, Dr. West, and thank you, Dr. Claude, for all of the great, uh, wonderful work uh, you all do here at Princeton University. Well, we salute the work that you do, not just on television, but in public arenas around this country and the world, as well as private ones. Your courage, your vision, your bearing witness has always been an inspiration to me. Well, thank and you, I'm sir. sure that's true for so many, if not everybody here, and you do it with such dignity. I try. You do it with such integrity and such magnanimity. It's just a beautiful thing to see. Well, beautiful thing to as see. you know, most of the time, I believe the truth is on my side. And I, when I say my side, I'm referring to what's right versus what's wrong. And one of the things that disturbed me today, uh, Dr. West, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it disturbed so many of you, is this debate that we're having in Washington, D.C. It's a, it's a phony debate. It's a debate over priorities, and yet, at a time our country is recovering from one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression, the only solutions that are often talked about are solutions that would hurt poor people, hurt the middle class, and curtail our ability to grow the future by investing in poor communities, investing with the middle class. And so I call it a phony debate because it's, it's hard to get the truth out there when there are just so many lies, so many uh, uh, misleading statements. I mean, last year during the health care debate, I wanted to have an honest con conversation about the need to reform our health care system, and I found myself talking about abortion. And here we are now at a time we're talking about figuring out how we can live within our means, what government should do in the 21st century, and once again we're talking about abortion. And so last week I was on TV, I saw Mike Pence, he's the congressman from, El, uh, from Indiana. Uh, he's no longer a presidential candidate, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, but I, I, I told Congressman Pence to take his hands off the DC budget. I told mm. him to take his hands off women's health care and, and access to reproductive uh, the full range of reproductive health services. And finally, I told him, I said, if you want to take away my birth control, fine, I want your Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe we should balance the budget on the backs of poor people. I don't think we should take a budget axe to maternal health care, women, infant, and children. I do believe that we need to have an honest debate about our budgetary priorities and to look at what we're spending money on and to include in the debate conversations about what corporations should do to help us achieve a fiscally sound budget. It's ironic that I paid more taxes last week than GE. It, it gives new meaning to uh, screwing in your life bulb now, right? <laughs> Well, GE is Exxon Mobil, is Bank of America, and then GE CEO heads our dear brother Barack Obama's Commission on Jobs. That's right. That That's sounds right. like a pretty skewed perspective in terms of making that choice. But one out of four corporations in America didn't pay a penny. One out of four. Didn't pay a penny. We got a budgetary crisis. Budgetary crisis. And here come the cuts for the children. Here come the cuts for the poor. You see, I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, you and I, uh, uh, come out of the same tradition, which is the, uh, the legacy of Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells Barnett. We were just talking, the fact that it was one year ago, just yesterday, that the great Dorothy 
Irene Height uh, passed. She's a giant in so many ways. And it, it was called the Black Freedom Movement, but these days it's being reduced to Black Special Interest Group. But the Black Freedom Movement has always been about unarmed truth and unapologetic love, justice for all, concerned about others, beginning on the chocolate side of town, but spilling over to vanilla sides and red sides and brown sides and yellow sides, so that we're talking about justice and talking about fairness. And where do we find ourselves, that wonderful first line of Emerson's essay, Experience, where do we find ourselves in relation to the black freedom struggle in the age of our dear brother Barack Obama in the White House, a house built by black slaves, actually? along with the United States Capitol and, and most of the traffic circles that keep us going around in circles in Washington, D.C., we have this illusion that things are moving when, in fact, they're just going in circles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the night before Dr. King, um, a visionary, yeah. uh, a man of tremendous courage who inspired me and many of my generation mm -hmm. to fight for equality for all, on that last night of his life, he, he really gave us what I call a, bl a blueprint for the future. He said, he, Dr. King said that I've been to the promised land. And then he informed us that many of us would not get there, but we as a people would not get there. He believed that he would not get there, but his people. And he wasn't just referring to black people, he was referring to all people. Because remember why uh, uh, why Dr. King was in Memphis. He was there to help sanitation workers. I believe that we're stuck on that mountain. We're on that mountain, afraid to go into the promised land, waiting to take a, a temperature of whether or not most Americans want to go forward. And so we're stuck. Uh, we're stuck waiting for someone to lead us, afraid to go on our own, and afraid to take the necessary steps and risk to move forward as a country. So the election of Barack Obama was a very important milestone in our country. We achieved a very important milestone. But most Americans have been left to believe that we are somehow or another post-racial. We're not. We cannot, now, now that we have a black president, we, I believe, we don't even have the language to talk about race. We're afraid to talk about race. And if you inject race in the conversation, you're called a racist. Hmm. If you talk about the disparities in health and wealth and education and housing, then you're a racist. So, you know, today, I keep telling people, if you want to help people of color, if you want to help poor communities, if you want to move forward, just do it. Don't wait for permission. Don't, please don't take a poll. Because <laughs> polling in this country is, in my judgment, is like those boats in the Venice Canal. I mean, they're useless in rough waters, just useless. Mm. And so here we are, we're at this mountaintop moment. And we have to choose, we have to decide that we're going to go forward. I know that there are Republicans as well as Democrats that believe that somehow or another we must make a U-turn back to what, the 80s. We're somehow or another stuck between the ideals of the 1960s and the backlash of the 1980s. So politics during this period must become progressive. Because if we're not progressive, if we're not looking forward, if we don't have values that are inclusive of all people, then what we'll find ourselves doing is fighting over those same policies, same programs that got us in the mess that we're in. Mm. And therefore, you know, what most people want you and I to do is to fight over crumbs. I don't want to fight over 12% of the budget. Give me the whole budget. Give me every piece of it. I want the defense budget. I want the research and development budget. I want commerce. I want every piece of that budget. What they're telling us is that in order for us to win the future and to give corporations what they need to create jobs, we have to cut maternal health. We have to cut 60,000 kids from Head Start. We have to fire more public workers, more teachers, more firefighters. That's a false debate. That's a baloney debate. Mm -hmm. That's a debate that leads us back, not forward. Mm -hmm. So we're at a mountaintop moment. And I have to say one last thing. I'm going to shut up and drink my water. Oh, I got one more thing. Because, you know, as interim chair of the party, I got two weeks, sir. 
got two more weeks, and I go back to being a pumpkin. Cinderella got to fly on something. I'm a diva, so I might not be a pumpkin, but I'm going to have me something. Um, I love politics. I've been involved in politics since a little girl, but that's only one aspect of my life. One aspect. We, so many of us put all our hopes and dreams and expectations with politicians. Let me tell you, someone who's I worked on seven presidential campaigns, 58 congressional campaigns, 19 state and local campaigns, uh, 48 states, two more states, I will become Miss USA without the bikini. <laughs> the goal of getting involved in politics is to try to, you know, move change, try to help set priorities, try to help bring about the most visible leaders we have in society. Not all the leaders, but the most visible ones, our politicians. But at the same time, after every election, you know what I, I used to do when I was a kid? I'm still a kid, but you know, when I was much younger. <laughs> the day after election, I would go out there and start organizing and march. I would organize marches. I mean, and what we've forgotten is that after we hold an election, you gotta go out there and march. Go out there and march. The Tea Party, See, I'm not mad at the Tea Party. I know exactly what they're doing. I know what tune they're marching to. <laughs> you know what beat that is. You heard that old beat. That, we heard that during the Reagan years. This is some old, dry music. I mean, just dry. I mean, I, can, I don't know how you can even get your groove onto what they're saying. But, this, but when we created the dynamics for change, when we went out there in historic numbers and put Barack Obama in the White House. The next day, we should have got on our, put our marching boots on, got right up to the Capitol and said, now, nah. <laughs> let's have this conversation. Instead, we waited. With that, waiting for the world to change. We forgot that we're the change that we were looking for. Not him, mm. we are the change. Mm. We change and then we forgot it. We put a postcard on it and forgot the fact that we were the movement behind the change. And the Tea Party has filled that gap. And you know the media, they like, you know, this is the buzz of the week. Tea Party. Donald Trump is now in his 15th day of fame. He might get 15 more days, 15 more, because he's sucking up airspace. We got a lot of airspace, folks. So it's important to understand the context of where we are today as it relates to where, where we just left off back in 1980. This is the same group of people who opposed the New Deal, opposed the Great Society, opposed the changes in the 70s. They are back in full force with corporate backing. And if you don't watch it, they'll take us back. And as I said back in 2008, I am not going to the back of the bus. I am going to defy them every step along the way. I don't care how personally unpopular it is to fight for Pell Grants. I'm going to fight for Pell Grants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. going to fight for maternal health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, I will fight and criticize Republicans or Democrats if they choose to cut the district budget just simply because they can, because of the anomaly in the Constitution. Just because you have the right doesn't mean you should exercise it. it you're going to hurt poor people, a disproportionate number of young people, and people of color. I will fight. And if you come after my birth control, like I said, I want your bag. We're going to have a fight over that. Right. I'm going to fight for spirit. my birth control. Well, we need more fighting spirit, though. See, I'm Catholic no and I'm, I'm pro-choice. My priest knows it. You are <laughs> ex 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 extraordinarily courageous in that pro -choice. regard. Extraordinary. You remember when Martin died? When Martin died, he said the country has war priorities. He actually said he was sicker than he thought. And by sick, what he meant was, I think, he could see the greed and the hypocrisy and the indifference toward poor and working people and the downright cowardice in terms of just hatred. Hatred's always a form of cowardice. Hatred to coward, revenge against those who intimidate them. Mm -hmm. and so when Martin looked right before he was shot down like a dog in Memphis and looked at America, he saw an empire, not just a democratic experiment because he was concerned about Vietnam, the precious babies in Vietnam. He said, will America have what it takes to engage in this radical revolution in priorities on values 
or will they fall back into greed is good, politics of polarization, the indifference toward poor and working peoples. And one could argue that uh, with those magnificent breakthroughs in the 60s and 70s as a result of the social movements you were talking about, the black freedom movement, the student movement, feminist movement, anti-homophobic movement, and so forth, that by the 80s, we actually did see this kind of deeply right-wing moves, the distribution of wealth from working and poor people to the well-to-do, the cutback of taxes, the cutback of social programs, but not the military-industrial complex. No, it's increase. Yeah, increase. So we've seen the increase military-industrial complex. We've seen the increase of the prison-industrial complex. Yes. We've seen market-driven entertainment corporate media complex, and then Wall Street went from roughly 19% of the profits in the, in the country to today 42%. That's correct. So you got Wall Street oligarchs, corporate plutocrats at the top, paying less taxes, shaping the nation and the world in their image, outsourcing the jobs, the cheap labor markets, and then lobbyists bringing pressure to bear on the two parties. So you end up with a, a far right party, Republican party, Brother Paul Ryan's budget is just that, mm -hmm. that vicious attack on poor and working people, the escalation of a class war. And then you've got a Democratic Party that's reacting, especially Barack Obama, who is centrist. Sometimes he makes progressive gestures, as he did in his speech the other day. But when it comes time to really stand up with backbone, he compromises. And some people say caves in. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a right-wing party, Republicans, and a centrist right Democratic Party. And you were calling for progressive politics. How do progressives proceed when there's no party apparatus that is receptive in the way that they are? Well, first of all, when progressives are in power, yes. when they control the levers of power, they must exercise power on behalf of those who've been left out or left behind. Mm -hmm. Now, I spent two years when Democrats were in control of the House and Senate by vast majorities. As we mm. say, it was our <laughs> dream come true, super mm. majority. And the Republicans made a decision that they were going to sit on their hands. We're not helping. Y'all got a deficit? So. You're in a recession? So. You're losing jobs? So. We only have one priority, get rid of Obama. I mean, that was the Republicans. Mm. I mean, dispute me. Mm -hmm. Any Tea Party member here? <laughs> okay, dispute me. Because they sat on their hands. hands. They whined. They tried to block. What did the Democrats do? I'm a Democrat. And some of you dispute me. You know what the Democrats did? They said, oh, we, we got to pass this, but you know what? We better go over across the street and make sure across the aisle. Right, we better make right. sure that it's okay with them and it's okay, no, we don't like it. We don't like a thing, nope, we mm, nope. But suppose we add a little sweetness. Can we give you some tax cuts? What can we give you? So they gave one third of the stimulus, essentially to the Republicans, who then turned around and said basically, we're not gonna support it. We're not, we had, we had three Republicans in the United States Senate, the two wonderful women from Maine and, um, the one, uh, uh, our senator from uh, Pennsylvania who, who just lost, and, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm almost forgetting his name, and I rarely do that. Specter. 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 He was a Democrat for a moment. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> it basically was sure well. what happened was here the Democrats <laughs> had an opportunity to shape the budget, shape the conversation, reorder the priorities and values of this country, you know, cut back on the war, as we said we would do if the American people gave us the levers of power, uh, begin to refocus the country's priorities and attention on things that would ensure that we never had another recession like that before. Again, bargaining with the Republicans, trying to get the Republicans to go on. You know, the problem with Democrats is that we're very pragmatic. We're a very patient party. We're a very pragmatic party. And yes, we, we try to seek consensus. We try to bring the entire Democratic family together. But in doing so, the Republicans took advantage of all of what I call our divisions. And rather than lead with a focus, and we did a, look, let me just say this for the record. Mm. Nancy Pelosi will go down in history as one of the most effective speakers ever. Now, 
you may disagree with that, but let me tell you, she, she was able to corral the Democratic caucus to pass right. many of these initiatives that brought us back from the brink of an economic catastrophe. The conservatives will never admit that under George Bush, we had consecutive job losses, that we were hemorrhaging by the time he left office 22,000 jobs a day, 795,000 jobs a month. They will never admit that. Nor will they admit that in the last 13 months, we've seen job growth. Not enough, but we've had 13 months of small, insignificant job growth. Not enough to replace the jobs lost during the economic uh, downturn. But Democrats did not exploit the divisions within the Republican Party. Mm. Rather, they, we allow them to exploit our divisions, which often leads to what I call miscalculation of the electorate, downplay our priorities, and we basically come up with a, a budget deal or what I call deal, deals that really re resemble making boudin sausage. Boudin. Boudin. You ever boudin heard of boudin? Sauce. Oh yeah, man, that's, that, it's some good stuff. Now once you taste it, it might taste better than it smells or looks, but it's, it's, but it's oh. making sausage. The, 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 the way we make it, you don't want anyone to ever publicly see that. <laughs> and Democrats exploited all, I mean, oh. all of our weaknesses. So Barack Obama, in my judgment, my humble belief, he's a pragmatist. He is, a, he is as pragmatic what, what, as what, I've what, ever what, seen. What, what's the difference in your mind between a pragmatist and an opportunist? Because a, pra a pragmatist is somebody who takes advantage of opportunities. He takes a little bit of this from this group, a little bit of this. He makes jambalaya better than anybody I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Ain't no, but, but, it ain't, but, but, it, but it's but not jambalaya. You got to always be careful what you put in it, sir. But my, problem, but, my, but my problem is this, though. Is sometimes it's, it's unclear what he really stands for. You see, if you use King's legacy as the way in, in which you're getting access to the White House, sanitation workers, yes. you got trade union movements promising employers free choice act as a major weapon as bosses are pushing them against the wall, as public unions are demonized, teachers are being demonized and so forth. And that's what the trade union movement needs more than anything else is the employers free choice act promised right. by the president, hasn't been touched at all, you see. So you said, and we can go right down the, 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 the line, talking about poor people and bringing in Tim Geithner from the New York Federal Reserve, Larry Summers, God bless Brother Summers. <laughs> He's had problems for a long time, you know. But, but, but the most importantly, as we know, he, He's the one who deregulated derivatives. He's the one who said this is the right framework for the U.S. economy. He's the one who actually promoted the free market fundamentalism, the unfettered markets and so forth. What was Barack Obama thinking about in talking about coming out of the legacy that produced us to bring in these extensions of Wall Street oligarchs who have been exemplary in their greediness, in their avaricious behavior? None of them going to jail, <laughs> not one. Letitia's being grabbed right now because she got a crack bag. She's going to jail for seven years. Not one Wall Street oligarch given all the criminal activity that took place in the last three and a half years. We're not only talking about torturers and wiretappers as well. So that rule of law, very, very, uh, you know, double standard in that regard. But what does one say to someone who says, well, is it not the case that both of these parties have been too opportunistic and it would be nice to have genuine pragmatists who have ideals they stand for then fight for them. Well, you know, I, I, I took a look at this last budget deal mm -hmm. without going into personnel. Right. Okay. Right. And I took a look at this last budget deal and I was looking, I mean, of course there are a lot of things in this deal like the tax cut deal that I'm not a deal maker. Uh, Reverend Jackson taught me that, you, you know, there are two kinds of people, a tree shaker or a jelly maker. I'm a tree shaker. I, I think the president often makes a lot of jelly. He has to make jelly because we're, we're, he's governing at a time when the country is extremely polarized, divided, right, right. Uh, and one major political party has decided not to play at any level. 
So in order to get things done, in order to move the country, in order to move the economy, President Obama often have to bring in what I call all of these different forces, people, personnel, in order to make the various kinds of jelly to keep the government functioning. You know, the root of gumbo is, is, is not, uh, I'm from Louisiana, I, everything, I'm always cooking, baby. I can use sports metaphors, but I'm not gonna give men the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> because if I use sports metaphor, I can say President Obama is a quarterback and his team had a, had a defense but no offense. And you know what I would partly say? Hmm. He punched too much on first down. Oh! <laughs> yeah. Until the last down. Yeah. That's oh, what it is, the fights. Have, if you have some strong running backs, you can often, you know, have some plays that... That's can, true. All right. That's, but, all if, right. If, but if you're passing the football to Tim Geithner, that's not Jim Brown. <laughs> we get back to the cooking oh, no, metaphor. I can go back into Lynn Swan. I can get to Lynn Swan. If you, if, you, if you had somebody who can, who can catch when you threw on third and long, like That's Lynn true. Swan, let me tell you. Now, you know, I watch my ball, my baby. I'm a ball girl now. You're right about but that. The, the, but the soul of a gumbo is, 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 is the root. It doesn't matter if you're making chicken gumbo, shrimp gumbo, uh, gator gumbo, turtle gumbo, the root because that brings it all together. And I, I tell you what I saw after this last deal, because I think this is the essence of who he is and what, what he's about. The president wanted to protect, just like in a tax cut deal that extended the tax cuts to the wealthiest of Americans for two more years. The president said, okay, I, gotta, you know, I want tax cuts for the middle class extended. I'll get that. I won't get everything on the other end, but I'll get that. And he wanted a one-year extension of the unemployment benefits and some of the other tax, so-called right. tax sweeteners. So I think the president knows that with this group of lawmakers, uh, he can walk into the room and get certain things that keep that rule intact. For the president in this last budget deal, that was making sure that he kept the Head Start program making sure that he protected students already in enrolled in college with existing Pell Grants. I think the president went into the room saying, I gotta protect as many of the people who are dependent upon the safety net as possible. And he did one other thing that I thought was important. And that was he enlarged the number of items that the Republicans wanted to cut and the Democrats wanted to cut. So, he didn't just focus on discretionary spending, which would have changed the baseline. He also focused on mandatory spending, which expanded the amount of cuts. So again, this is sausage making. Nobody wants to hear about it. But I think the president protected as much of the, the rule as possible, knowing that long term, in order to make this gumbo taste, taste all right, taste good, he's going to have to add some Tabasco. I think this president has been lacking some Tabasco. Now that's the only criticism mm. I give of Obama. Mm. I like my men spicy hot. Just throw it on me, baby. Throw it, throw it, on. it on me. Throw it on me. Make it hot. Well, how, how come? How come he doesn't have that kind of spice? Hey, brother West. Some people are born with it. Some people have to get it as they walk the path of justice. And I think this president it has figured out that no matter how many you know, olive branches he extend, no matter how many beer summits and whatever else you want to call it, arugula summits, he's not going to get cooperation from the Tea Party, nor will he get cooperation from conservatives or corporations because they, they, want, they want a smaller government, they are not interested in Medicare, Social Security, all of the social contracts. They want to get rid of all of that. They basically, at the end of the day, just want to have a strong defense, and that's it. Mm. I mean, let's mm. just pare it on down and pare stop down. pretending that we're, we're fighting over, you know, cuts. Because I tell my conservative friends, my Tea Party friends, some of whom are my neighbors, they love my gumbo, but I said, if I cut the ingredients out of my gumbo the way you want to cut the budget, this would be just soup. <laughs> you want a gumbo, right? A gumbo requires certain ingredients, just like a country as diverse and large as the United States of America deserve to have a, a workforce, a quality workforce 
with the skills needed to not only attract businesses, but compete with China, Brazil, and India. We can, you know, and I, I love it when I hear a conservative say, we gotta take the burdens off of the, you know, blah, blah, so we can create the job. I'm like, who in the hell going into a community and, and, and create jobs when you're cutting back on maternal health and child care and education? I mean, that's not jobs of the future. That's, mm. that's smoke screen. Mm. That's blue smoke and mirrors. So, but the terrain is already conservative. If you're going to fight about the extent and scope of the cuts, when you really need job creation, you really need stimulation, you really need private and public sector coming together to generate jobs with a living wage, then you're already far removed from not just your base, but your principles. I'll give you an example. I was at uh, Wagner. Uh, yes, uh, yesterday, day for yesterday, I forget which day my days run into each other. This week. This week, that's Praise right. God. In this lifetime. In this lifetime. Yeah, a couple of days. <laughs> and uh, I tell you, look at the brother's eyes, and these are young brothers, that's the youth correction on your garden stage right mm -hmm. across the way in Bordentown. And you can see the depth of neglect and abandonment, not just of some of the fathers, the mothers are always there holding on for the most part, even though they're sometimes dealing with their own challenges. But socially, institutionally, structurally, going back to 81, there's been such a massive neglect and abandonment of poor people and working people that is now generation after generation. I, oh, I read Charles Blow's piece in New York Times, 62% mm -hmm. of young black brothers between 16 and 26 stop and frisk by the New York Police Department, only 3% of them arrested. Now, I know that our dear president, if that were to happen on the vanilla side of town, he'd have a press conference in a minute. I know if it were to happen to investment bankers, he'd have a round table in a second. But when it comes to these black brothers who seemingly don't have a voice and don't have an institution to filter their concerns, he might say in private, because I, I trust him, you know, he's a decent brother. Barack Obama's got to be a decent brother. I'm sure he's telling Sister Michelle, yeah, I know Jamal's catching hell up there. I, I feel so bad about that. Wow, 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 something, something, something. But there's no attempt to connect with the base directly. Even when he went to my dear brother Al Sharpton's his National Action Network, he wouldn't mention, he wouldn't say a mumbling word because he knows Fox News is going to use it against him, but Fox News is going to use anything against him. So when do you take a stand, especially if you're talking about Martin King? He got a, a, a statue of Martin King looking at him every day in the Oval Office. What is Martin saying to that brother? <laughs> Quit dropping those drones in Pakistan. You're killing some innocent people. You already dropped 110 this year. I died struggling against Vietnam. Concerned about the poor, not just the black, but it's nothing wrong with starting with the black. How come? Other than the red brothers and sisters, we the ones catching the most hell. So it, and then it spills over to our poor white brothers and sisters, our poor brown and so forth. I don't hear that kind of language in Barack Obama at all. Now, have you heard anything like that? Have well, I missed out on something? You know, I, I tell you maybe what I hear from Barack Obama yeah. and what I hear from other political leaders at this time is that we have to live within our means. We have to have the critical skills necessary to compete. I mean, I know all of the verbiage. I know all of the right. polls. And you know they're lying. They're lying. Iraq comes along, we got a trillion dollars. I hadn't planned on that but, war, but, but we got brother, to live for the cash. Brother West, I've always believed that our future Yes. Our future lies in each and every one of us, in our own way, taking the necessary steps to build that path to the future for, so that others may follow. Absolutely. Barack Obama, as president of this country, can set the tone and set the example. That's right. But I also believe it has to come from inside the community yes. itself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying that as a little girl growing up poor in Louisiana, having Lyndon Johnson as my first president, well, John F. Kennedy and then Lyndon Johnson, I mean, it made a huge difference Absolutely. in my life. Absolutely. Think about it. I was able to get a head start in life, the Head Start program, and that was more than a childhood, uh, uh, that was more than just an education program. That was a childhood nutrition program, childhood immunization program. I mean, it was huge. And again, I think the President of the United States mm -hmm. making sure that we keep that rule, keep that 
the fundamental safety net intact. That is his principal priority. But I also think that some things are happening in the black community today that government cannot solve. That government, no matter if it's progressive, regressive, conservative, you name it, we have to take some downtime and go internal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, am, I, I never gave birth to one child, but I probably have had 300. Mm. I mean, the, just the number of children that I mentor, that I put through school, every day of my life I am focusing on how I can help a child. I don't, but, but where are the parenting skills out here? I mean, my mom and my dad, my mother was a maid, God bless her soul, died too early. That's mm. why I fought for health care. Lord, Lord. I fought for health care. Yes, I Lord. mean, I fought with everything I had. My dad is 80 years old, gone on 25. <laughs> He's single with two women, and probably the PM1 is coming over now. <laughs> it's a small window when you can call my 80-year-old daddy. But my parents every night would call us into their room in the order of our birth, Cheryl, Sheila, Donna, Teddy, Chet, Lisa, Demetri, Kevin, Ziola. And they would make us get on our knees and then instruct us. I mean, my, and I was scared of my mother. My father, I knew he had some soft spots. I could talk about the saints and talk about stuff, and he could be like, oh, really? <laughs> he totally could get, you know, you know, reorganized. But my mother was, I'm head chief and commander. I'm running this house. If you don't like these rules, you can get out. But as long as you're living under my house, my rules, and my roof, hear the rules. Education, education, education. They drilled it into us. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were just yeah. scared. When I hear today some of my students, I got a cold. Oh really? Take some castor. Oil. I mean, we had to drink castor. Oil. We didn't even have no, we, we didn't go to the doctor. I mean, I got cramps. How many times you I'm like, cramps? You can't come to school for cramps. Oh my God, I went to school with cramps in my legs, cramp here, cramp there. I mean, excuses, we had no excuse. We had a zero tolerance policy with regards to education. Today, Brother West. Oh yeah, I know, you're right. We have to explain to our children that there are no jobs of the 21st century without an education. It is hard. And this recession, if we, if we haven't learned one thing, in this recession, people without a high school diploma, they have caught hell. This is not the 50s where you can work on the farm and still make a living. You need a degree. And I'm not just talking about a high school diploma, I'm talking about some college and to make sure that your skill set. So mm -hmm. let me go back Talk to, right let, me go back, let me go back. It's inside and outside, within the black community and outside. And outside. I'm with and you, it's, it's both hands, not either one. It's and both hands. We, we, I, I agree with you, the public private. Yeah. But back in the day, brother, yes. when things got really hard, because sometimes daddy got laid off, mama didn't have as many houses to clean and as many parties to serve. That's the reason why I never got married. I had wedding cake every week. <laughs> It was nothing sweet after the third or fourth bite. You're <laughs> like, oh no, I, ain't, I don't want this. And those little pickles. <laughs> no, 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 but, 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 but marriage is more than the wedding cake. Man. I know, but baby, I had too much wedding cake uh -oh, as a child. Oh, I, know, I, know, yeah. I know, you got the whole thing down. <laughs> I don't have it down. Marriage is more than the wedding cake oh, now. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby, let's, we'll get to the honey. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I'll slap something on you tonight, baby, that you want ever get off you when I finish it. You know, I know that's I know that story, but okay. I'm not going to. No, 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 no. All right. I was, I was talking about things spiritual, actually, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's the lyrics, it's the rhythm, sugar. <laughs> it's the rhythm. Because the beat comes from knowing the lyrics, but the rhythm is that's what right. makes the song. Oh, All Lord, right, don't yeah. start it. Oh, no, sucky, 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 sucky oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, That's indeed. another issue that we, these kids can dance, but they don't understand how to dance to the song. That's all true. Right. Or they don't know how to dance with each other. Well, thank you. They out there all on their own. But the way they dance is a symbol and a symptom of how they grew up. Did we go back to the That class? is to say, they don't have the high quality relations. Yeah. They don't have the nuanced social skills of how to yeah. follow the sister in the groove as she moves to make her feel good about herself and the music. Uh -huh. But part of that has to do with. <laughs> back it up. Back it up. Back it up. There you My go. My mama said, if you got it, show it. 
if you want, don't start. But but I don't know. But I mean, but you're hitting because part of that has to do with the fact, though, that in the market-driven culture that they grew up in, that we we had neighborhoods. Too many of them have hoods. Right. Which is to say that they've got weapons of mass distraction bombarding them every moment of their lives that reinforces desire, base desire. 500 TV channels, we had three. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah on a good and, day. And the radio and the video and the, the recording industries have become so obsessed with manipulation of their bodies rather than the stirring of their souls. Because see, you would listen to Curtis Mayfield and they listen to Soldier Boy. Mm -hmm. That's a drop. I know. That's a serious <laughs> drop, you see. Well, well, free the pain. Bring the boys home. Bring oh, them back love. alive. Yeah, you know, Curtis was writing for her. Oh, oh yeah, she's Chicago. Oh, I, you you uh, look at my iPad right now. And I tell you, I was sitting next to Otis Williams on an airplane recently. The oh, Temptations. from The Temptations. Baby, I did this. I said, you want me to dial it up? I, I still got those old songs. You play a little heavenly? Oh, absolutely. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> But, that's, but see, that's, that is the embodiment of the love that you are in terms of those 300 kids. You see what I mean? You were taught, as Dorothy Height taught us, to yes. lift as you climb. Thank you. To be human is to find joy in serving others, beginning with the least of these, and always a we consciousness rather than an I consciousness. That's correct. But our young people these days of all colors, because y'all saw this film, Social Network. Oh, yes. I mean, that's a level of spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation <laughs> that you find in any black and brown hood of poor people. An emptiness of soul, a hollowness of soul is all about getting over, obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> grabbing, 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 convinced just to be the smartest in the room and the richest in the room. No talk about compassion, no talk about love, no talk about justice, just smart and rich. Right. And, yeah. and that's, that's emptiness and, and in the end. And not worried about the least of these. Not worried about oh. the quality of life of our community, that's exactly our country. Right. That's exactly Who right. Who we are as a country. I think we are that's defining right. ourselves as we speak in this big budget debate. That if we're not thinking about the future, how do we grow the economy so that everybody has access to the American dream? So that a child today can think about where he or she wants to be 10 years from now. I'm worried. That's why, I be, I, that's why I, I remain engaged in the public policy debates of the day. It's extremely frustrating to be out there each and every day on TV when you're sitting there trying to combat a lie. And it's just a simple lie, that's but the lie point. has been told and it's been retold so that it's this big. And the truth is just this simple. But you can't get the mm. truth out. The truth is, is that we are a vastly rich country. country. We are extremely talented and well blessed. And yet you would not know that. And this debate, this narrow debate that we're having over the budget, Absolutely. which obscures the fact that we can provide for our children. We can uh, invest in critical infrastructure, education, and human resources That's so that we right. can right. be a competitive nation of the future. But that requires us to understand the moral underpinnings of all of these economic policies that we address each and every day of our lives. But I go back to my parents. I tell you, what a mother, I used to, I used to, you know, not curse. I was always a faithful child. She said, "Lord, Lord, 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 Lord." I mean, boy, I mean, of all the things and all the, you know, the people uh, I saw growing up as, as as a child in the Deep South, I came to love my parents because they were just dedicated to all nine of us. They wanted what was best for us. Mm -hmm. They they sacrificed mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. When my mom died. And you know, when you go home, Cornell, and yeah. my mom didn't have, she didn't have clothes or shoes. Or, you know, my mom, my mom left a couple pots. Hmm. She, she left two dresses, we buried her in one. Lord, Lord. Three pair of shoes, including her working shoes and one pair of shoes to go to church and one pair of shoes when she sat on the porch because she always looked good when she sat on the porch. <laughs> um, but my mom was a simple person. And even today, my dad, you know, when I saw my family go through Katrina, and that was tough. Mm. But, I, but I looked back and I said, 
God, we, we had the right values. Oh, Lord, yeah. Poor, man. I mean, we, we used to put the definition in poverty. I mean, we were poor. But, but the, the, the spiritual, spiritual values. Spiritual deaths and moral The death. moral values. That's true. I mean, even That's to this true. day, my father used to say, he said, wage not, want not. You know, don't, don't go out there and buy what you don't need. I mean, when I think about the iPods and all the things, I tell my nieces and nephews, do not call Auntie Donna for no tennis shoes, no designer this, that, and the other. Education, education, education. I just want to say this, and then we open up for questions, because I see mm -hmm. Jennifer back there trying to pretend she's Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> today, I just want to announce, I mean, my little niece, a Katrina, a child that had to wait five days, like my dad and my sister and her husband, to get rescued off their porch, their roof. Oh, Lord. She... Uh, she signed a four-year scholarship to Southeastern University. She got a four-year scholarship. Beautiful. Uh, and, you know, Beautiful. And Beautiful. My other little niece, now I'm, I'm ending the first half of the girls in my family. I'm about to get into like my little nephews who are 12 and 13. I don't know, the Brazils had two boys, two girls, four girls, and then four boys. I don't know, I'm, I'm, we're a little weird family, but we, 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 we will make some children, <laughs> trust me. And so, but I, I told my sisters and brothers, I said, now, I'm, I'm finished with phase one, phase two. I'm about to get into them little boys now. Let me tell you now, you know, because see, one was following me on Facebook. I said, Elmo, you're 12. Hey, Auntie Don, I'm like, oh, no. I have to watch my language. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you understand, we yes, all yes, have yes. to be engaged with our families. Right. The churches need to come out of the business of building the largest church and go back into building families and building communities. That's right. That's we right. need to make sure that our, everybody, all hands on deck. That's, that's right. A community, we, what did, what did uh, well, it's an African proverb, it takes a village. And we're part of the larger village. I want to be in a, I want to be in a, a community, in a, in a village, in a country that supports the least of these. Support everybody. Because I think about my own life. Mm. Growing up in a segregated deep south, had that civil rights movement, had the movement for women's equality, the movement for gender equality not come through. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'd still be stuck there on Fillmore Street right up against the levee. Praying to God mm. that the next storm don't take us away. Mm. That's why I'm out here. That's why we should all be out here fighting for peace, justice, and freedom each and every day of our lives. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, indeed. I know, I know. Yeah, questions, questions, comments. We can talk all day. This is the most interesting man I've, I've met in a long, long time. <laughs> of all his books. <laughs> I'm always blessed to be here. I, I even have his recordings on my, on my, my music. You got some of the music, too? Hey, Boo Boo, come on. Ooh. My sister, I'm, I'm You know, we got a new album with Bootsy Collins coming out April 26th. April 26th? The funk capital of the world. Can I download it? Oh, Lord, yes. Oh. Indeed, indeed. All right, I love that. We're going to make you get Psychedelic funk. Psychedelic funk. <laughs> Hi, uh. My name is Jacob Reeses. I'm a sophomore here. And Professor West, thanks for giving us the week off in class. Uh, really appreciated that. Um, Ms. Brazil, thanks so much for taking a little bit of your time to come out here. I'm sure you're very busy in DC. Uh, you've done a really great job of taking some pointed questions from Professor West. So I don't, hope you don't mind if I ask you a pointed question myself. Um, what do you think it says about the state of race relations in this country that when you have a grassroots opposition movement to this president based on his legislative agenda, it's dismissed by a lot of people on the left as just racism. Uh, do you think the Democratic Party is at all guilty of playing the really destructive game of identity politics? You know, especially, in, not to call you out specifically, but using terms like, you know, they're trying to put us in the back of the bus again. Do you think that that does us more harm than good? Oh, absolutely not. I am, I am speaking personally as a woman of the segregated South who had to live under those segregated circumstances, who had to endure racism as a child growing up, who had to live in a segregated community. So I know exactly who I am and what I speak about when I say I'm not going to the back of the bus, mm -hmm. because I've been there and I'm not going back. That is a statement. That is a statement of reality. And let me go further. And the reason why maintaining control over my body 
is so personal to me, so morally important to me, is because my grandmother and my mother and my great-grandmothers did not have control over their bodies. This is a statement of fact. This is personal. Now let's talk about the Tea Party. When the Tea Party came on the quote-unquote political radar, I looked at them, I saw what they were saying, I knew exactly what was behind them. Mm, yes, mm. there are people in this country who are fed up with government control over their lives. They don't want government to threat mm -hmm. on them, they don't want government to control their guns, their weapons, their whatever. I understand that sentiment. I faced that sentiment when I ran Al Gore's campaign, when people said, well, Al Gore's going to take away this. Take Look, there's always what I call fear in the electorate. People who believe, rightly or wrongly, in my judgment, they're wrong, but who believe that when Democrats run, we, our focus is to take away someone's rights or take away someone's guns. And so there's a, the Tea Party, in my judgment, was an anti-gun uh, anti-gun, anti-government, anti-choice. I mean, they were a bunch of anti-all of this combined into one. Mm. And since the election of Barack Obama, because remember, we had during Clinton years, as well as George Bush, we've always had people, whenever you elect a Democrat, they're opposed to the Democrat, you elect a Republican, they're, because that's the partisan nature of our politics. Where I disagree with the Tea Party is, is their focus on cutting government spending by basically cutting social programs only and not looking at the entire federal budget. When the defense secretary stands up and say, we, we, can, we can find $78 billion in waste after we've seen the defense budget go from $235 billion to $685 billion over the past decade, hey, I'll take the $78 billion, but no, 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 we don't want to cut that. So what is a movement based on just cutting social programs and not looking at wasteful spending in every aspect of the federal budget? So that's my differences. I've never called members of the Tea Party racist because I don't know what's in their hearts. We've called out individual Tea Party members when they've gone public with, with all kind of scurrilous attacks on the president. And we've said, well, that is inappropriate. But I don't cast people as racist simply to have a conversation. I think that cheapens the conversation and it doesn't allow us to have a very intellectual or a very grown up conversation about our priorities. Mm -hmm. Now, I can keep you here all night about the race card. <laughs> I've seen the race card played from the bottom of the deck, top of the deck, middle of the deck, the whole deck exposed. If we got into a conversation on race in American politics, structural inequality, racism, sir, we could stay here for a while. But I don't want to have a backwards conversation, especially if we're not forward leaning. I do believe that we can move beyond this whole, what I call, race-based conversation. It's superficial. I often tell Wolf, and I, I have great respect for Wolf, why are you doing another superficial conversation? What did Ross Limbaugh say? I'm like, Glenn Beck, I don't really want those conversations. Those mm. are superficial because we don't get into the real nitty gritty about wealth, yes. inequality, That's structural. Right. We right. don't do any of that. You know, my dad, 80 years old, I tell you, go and see that man. He's on his second girlfriend, but he's a good man. <laughs> I went home one day, and his first one was leaving. He asked me if I wanted a beer. I said, well, next thing you'll be offering me is a cigarette, dad. I don't want any of that. But I love my father because he's 80 years old and my dad is a very wise man. And my dad said when he came back from Korea after mm. serving his country, he said he assumed that things would be easier. After all, my dad was a high school graduate. He had two years of college at Grambling and he said he couldn't find a job. He said he had just put his bite on the line. He was injured for his country and he came back and he was still a black man in the deep south. And my daddy said he wanted to provide for his family. So he went out of his way out of his way each and every day just to go downtown in New Orleans on the bus, sitting on the back, trying to keep the dignity about himself. He was a return. My father is a war hero. I have his medals from Korea. Mm. And my dad said the only reason why he didn't break down because he didn't want his children to see him cry mm. and break down. Mm. He said but it was the most humiliating thing each and every day to be called a boy up until the time he was in his 50s. And I vowed to my dad. I said, Sir, 
I ain't going to the back of the bus. That's where it comes from. It comes from my dad. It comes from my World War II grandfather, my great uncle who had to get rescued off the roof only to have a heart attack and then I had to struggle to bury him. This race thing is deep. Some people still have the scars. I can't change what my daddy went through, but I can vow to my nieces and nephews and my friends, we won't go back. And sir, that's all I'm saying. Dr. Cannell, Ms. Brazil, it's an honor to get to ask you all a question. And I just need y'all's help understanding something. Um, I'm also trying to figure out exactly what the difference is between pragmatic progressivism and cautious centrism. And so I was wondering if y'all could provide me two specific progressive things that you think Obama could do that won't leave us with the President Romney or Gingrich or Palin in 2012. The most progressive things you think he can achieve without leaving us with the worst president. I have one. I mean, I can talk about war because I think that is draining our budget. Yes, Again, yes. my criticism of the Tea Party, I mean, not all Tea Party members because got to give it to Ron Paul. He's consistent. He knows that $2.9 billion we spend in every week. I mean, that's me and Ron Paul don't agree on much, but we sure enough agree on that one. I agree now, with him on that too. I mean, I'm, at some point, we got to just stop that. Absolutely. I mean, they got yeah. weapon systems that are older than me, and I'm old now. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you still using that? Uh, but I would hope that what would distinguish this president from Pale and Romney, whatever, I would hope that this president will vow to veto any attempt, any attempt to roll back the gains that we made on health care. I, I, I just believe it is morally indefensible for a nation as rich as ours not to have a 21st century you know, uh, health care system. And, and while the, the health care reforms we passed last year, I mean, left a lot to be desired. Again, it's, it's another case of boudin and sausage making. It is still a step in the right direction to, find, to figure out ways to in, increase the number of, of Americans who are able to have access to health care in this country. So I would hope that that is a distinguishing, I, I, I'm hoping that in 2012, we know what the Republicans going to fight for. Obama is bad. He's destroyed our country. Things are bad. Things are not going to get better until we give corporations everything they need and, and, and all more tax cuts. Tax cuts. We've had $1.7 trillion of tax cuts since 2007. Hmm. I mean, we cut taxes anymore, man. We won't have no, no, no ability revenue at all. to even, That's and, and look, those no. FAA controllers sleeping on the job. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm worried about the meat inspectors. We they, they, talking about the FAA. <laughs> I want, that's why I gave up meat for Lynn. I said, oh, wait a minute. Look, y'all know they're being too stingy. I'm not eating nobody's meat right now. I don't know what they, FDA, uh-uh, I'm done. I'm done with all of that. Carnell, I gave it all up. Mm -mm. Well, I'm, I'm down to basic water. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's appropriate, actually, that, that we're here during uh, not just Passover for our Jewish brothers and sisters, but Holy Week for Christians like ourselves. Yes. Because when, when Jesus went into Jerusalem, he didn't go into the marginal ghettos of the city. He went straight to the temple, which was the center of political and economic and religious power, and he ran out the money changers. And that was a priority. And I want to see a vision that puts a priority on poor and working people, especially the children, beginning with preschool education, preschool health, preschool care, and a focus on the prison industrial complex and the need for the kind of reform in that system, including the juvenile system as well as the jails and prisons. We spent $340 billion, that's a Marshall Plan, but it's a carceral, penal Marshall Plan on jails and prisons and the criminal justice system. So we say we don't have the money, but anytime we need a war or a new prison, we find the money. But when it comes to education, school, especially the children of all colors now, of all colors. And the reason why Jesus went into that temple was because he came out of a tradition that said to be human is to make sure you have loving kindness to the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless. And when you look at America in that vein, 
America at this point is failing utterly. Utterly, 21% of our children living in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world, that's a moral disgrace. And we won't even talk about the way workers are being treated these days in terms of being pushed against the wall with the outsourcing and so on. And Wisconsin is an example of that. So that one of the things I'd like to see is, for example, it would be nice to have a financial tax on all of the transactions on Wall Street. <laughs> just, just a tax on it. You see what I mean? It'd be nice to downsize the banks so that they're not too big to fail and therefore to have too much political influence to be accountable. And the folks are not too little to rescue. You see, that's the kind of orientation. That's the legacy of Martin King. That's the legacy of Dorothy Hyde. That's the legacy of Dorothy Day and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. But that's the tradition that right now is relatively weak and feeble in our society is because we don't have enough people and don't have enough young people who are in touch with precisely that kind of spirituality and morality that you see exemplified in my dear sister Donna and the tradition that produced her and your mama's spirituality is that work in your soul every day. Every day. And the witness that you bear every day. I have great respect for sister Donna because she works inside of the system. I teach at Princeton but that's not really inside the system. That's inside a highly privileged institution of higher learning connected to the system. <laughs> but I'm very much an outsider, so I can say a whole lot of things that it would be very difficult for her to say because she's able to filter it in such a way she preserves her integrity, she hits hard, but she's inside in terms of the Democratic Party. You see, so I can stand outside and talk about the party spineless and milk toast and tied to corporate interests and so forth and so on. And she can look at me and say, Brother West, now uh, I see what you're saying, but it's more than that. <laughs> She's right. She's right. Because you got to have wiggle room on the inside. And I support the folk who are courageous, who are still holding on to that legacy of King and others on the inside. And uh, that's one reason why it's just so nice. But I, I will not be silenced. That's right. That's right. And I will, my value system is such that I cannot be silent. Yes, that's it right. It is very difficult for me to maintain my silence when I see people hurting. That's right. It, I cannot do that. And when I see a wrong, my mother taught us to try to right it and not to walk past a fight. If it was a right fight, she said, you get engaged in it. My mother was a serious woman. Yeah, That's why my yeah. daddy, when my mother died, my daddy went to cash his check and they told me his signature was not on file. <laughs> your mother, your mother had my it? mother had the signature. She took it with her. <laughs> That's why you got two women now. He's afraid. <laughs> He's afraid. <laughs> He's afraid. <laughs> He's afraid. He's afraid. He's afraid. He's afraid. Oh, that's Talk all about right. my old 80 year old pa. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got a, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Anna Daly, and I Anna. chair the um, state prison committee under the NACP. I'm also one of the state officers. And I am so happy to be able to hear you in this form of conversation here. Two things. One, I want to know what can I do? How can I contact, or who do I need to contact to help to get on the bandwagon to bring the Pell Grant support back into the prisons? Mm -hmm. And number two, I would like to hear you tell us about the Sentencing Reform Act. Now, we know that there was one passed, but what is being done to reform these laws that are used, the zirconian laws, the Jim Crow laws, because I grew up in the Jim Crow experience back in the 60s, but we, it's, we, it's going right back. What is your feeling, your expression, your opinion on how the Sentencing Act can be, uh, Sentencing Reform Act can be in place? Are you referring to Citizen United, the Supreme Court decision that gave corporations the uh, unlimited power to influence elections? No. Okay, well, I don't, I'm not familiar with the Citizen Act. What, which? Yeah, oh, yeah, the, yeah, oh, the sentencing. Sorry, ma'am, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just tell you, in terms of Pell Grants, I mean, as you well know, there are so many punitive measures right now that even would put further restrictions on the Pell Grant. This is a, this is a moment in politics where we have to play both defense and offense. 
to stop the erosion of some of the gains that we've made, especially in improving and reforming our Pell Grant system and increasing the amount of money uh, that students are, are able to receive. But we also got to stop all of these draconian measures to restrict where these resources will go and who will receive them. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged attack. We got to do the, the defense so that we don't see any more cuts or decreases in the Pell Grant programs. And we also have to go out there to ensure that people who need access to Pell Grants, be they in the criminal justice system or outside, they have access. And you know, there's a movement now to penalize people in the criminal justice system. All, you know, I don't understand it because if you look around the country, and Dr. West is absolutely right. When you look at all of the decisions that governors are making, they're closing mental institutions, but they're expanding prisons. I mean, so you sit back and you said, Arizona, Mississippi, I, I read all of the state budgets because I travel a lot, and I'm like, this makes no damn sense. And so the first thing we have to do as, as citizens in this great democracy is that we have to engage ourselves in the process. We have to write our lawmakers. We have to write our governors. We have to communicate with our local elect officials as well as our federal officials. Just because you set out the last election doesn't mean that you don't have a voice. Your voice is your power. You need to use your power. And as it relates to the sentencing guidelines, I mean, the NAACP went out there and got bipartisan support for it. And all of a sudden, there's no movement. The NAACP is a very, very forceful organization. Just recently, they were able to get Grover Norquist and others on the re Republican side. Grover Norquist is the champion of the anti-tax mm -hmm. campaign mm -hmm. a crusade in this country. And the fact is, is that now Christian conservatives are finally recognizing that we are putting more and more money into prisons at a time we should be investing in other priorities. Yeah. So I think it's important yeah. that the NAACP continue to come out of its comfort box and to find those coalitions. You know, who said it best? I think it was the Congressional Black Caucus. We have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. And we have to build coalitions and then flex our political muscle. You know, I often tell people, especially in the black community, Hispanic community, and women in particular, do you all know if we ever used our political muscle, we wouldn't be having this conversation? Okay. Women are the majority of voters in this country. Mm. And yet, when you look, look around this country, we hold less than 17% of elected positions. In fact, we've, we've had a decline in the number of women serving in elected office. And the first thing the Republicans did, and yes, Republicans pay attention, because I'm about to tell you something that you did that I'm pissed off about. Um, first thing you did was you decided not to support the Equal Pay Act. Now, Brother Carnell, I want to make as much money as I can, while I can, and as long as I can. There's no reason to pay me less simply because I'm a woman. And at the rate we're going now, I will not reach parity with a man until 20, 2056. Now, by my clock, I will be 97. Now, knowing me, I'm going to stay around just to fight. <laughs> but we need to put women in leadership positions. Why you? Because there's no one better. Why now? Because tomorrow is not soon enough. Young people, prepare yourselves to answer the call to serve. And for minorities, Latinos, Blacks, Asian Pacific Americans, Native Americans, African Americans, we have enough political clout and voting power to impact change at all levels. Yet if we don't use our power strategically, then you know what? We dilute our power. And so it, it, we need to understand that need, we need more of us need to be in the room, in the arena, at the table when decisions are made so that we can have a good inside-outside strategy. Inside, outside. You know, the fact, that, the fact that Brother West is out there fighting make my job easier. I told everybody that I'm going to see Carnell West, man. I'm going to tell you, they would treat me nice today. <laughs> okay. You should have seen, I even got a ride to the damn train station, right? <laughs> Chair of the party, I don't get no car, no driver, no salary, but I got a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew it, too. They said, because, you know, we've been on Twitter. I said, Lord, I got to see Carnell every day. I get a ride. <laughs> you see what I mean? Wow. I mean, we, we got to do inside outside. Oh, absolutely. We got to play offense and defense. But the most absolutely. important thing we do strategically in the 21st century is that a change in electorate must remain engaged in the electoral arena. You cannot vote on Tuesday and on Wednesday to say, I'm done, go home, it's over, and 
postcard. No. Get on your marching boot. Go out there and fight. Mm -hmm. Fight as if your life depended on it. And that's what we have to do each and every day. Mm. I just want to just point out that this sister Anna Daly, she's a living legend here in terms yeah. of both NAACP and the work. We were in the prison just together two days ago. We've been there so many times. But just give her a hand because she's yeah. such a living. And it's so nice to have this conversation. So wonderful to have this conversation. And you all get a chance to connect and so forth. My, well. my column last month, uh, last uh, in Ms. Magazine, dealt with women in prison. Because that, that is another yeah. one of my interests and another one of my, you know, among all the other active interests that I have in American politics. So I'm with Can you. I just make one additional about that permanent interest? Yeah. Because I, I think that I, I can see the politicians saying that, but we'd want to add permanent principles. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I don't want to die for my interests, but I'll die for principles. Gotcha. You know what I mean? And that's true for both of us because Absolutely. we come out of the same tradition. tradition. I agree. The same tradition. It doesn't mean I don't have no interest. I, I got some interest now. <laughs> but I'm not going to die but for But your it. interest can be bargained away. Absolutely. And you, but your principles The principles, you're never. not up for sale. Not up for bargain. There's no highest bidder. There's integrity. You die for something like that. Absolutely. That's right. All right. We'll take another question. Yes. yes Hi. Um, my name is Wanda Cousins, and I'm also with the NAACP. But my question is general. I've been involved in politics, um, I guess, since I was about three years old. I've uh, had an interest. How is it that um, President Obama, I'm going to be hoping that you have his ear, can expect someone like me who's been involved forever? And at this point, I'm asking, what's the point? What happened with the banking industry and no one has been to jail, no one has been punished. We've seen that it was a structured event, that these things were planned, that it didn't just happen, that people went through criminal procedures to cause this financial uh, crisis that we're in. And yet not one person is giving back a nickel. Um, not one person has, uh, had to pay the price for the ill-gotten gains that they've received. So you make people who play the game fairly feel like, mm. what's the point? Because they're not being punished. And, and I, 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 at this point, like I said, I think until, since all these cards have been exposed and we know that this was a contrived event, not just, you know, point A getting to point B at the wrong time in the wrong place. These things were thought out in back rooms. Uh, systems were put in place to cause this to happen. And then not one person, uh, I mean, you, you're allowed to take that money and, and live happily ever after. And then we're talking about cutting health, um, health care and Medicare and, 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 and low income programmings and 50 cents for Mary. When meanwhile, all these big financiers who pretty much set up almost a collapse of the country and nobody's being punished, mm. it, it, it's, it's too much to swallow. No, I, I, I hear you. I resonate. I mean, the important thing is you never want to allow other people's gangster activity to dampen your own spirit. See what I mean? In fact, you want to keep track of their gangster activity so you know what not to do. That's part of what it is to be a deep Democrat, because democracy is about what? Curtailing arbitrary use of power whether in the name of the law or trying to get around the law. And of course, black folk have been dealing with slavery, Jim Crow, Jane Crow, which is nothing but gangster activity, the use of arbitrary power to degrade us, demean us, murder us, maim us, uh, keep us afraid and intimidated and so forth and so on. So that what you point out is real. What you point out is Good Friday. What it means to be crucified, what it means to be spit on, what it means to be rebuked and scorned. And yet at the same time, you wrestle with that despair and you say, but you know what? I'm not going to allow that gangster activity to define the kind of person I choose to be. I'm still going to struggle. I'm still going to fight for justice. I'm still going to be concerned about the folk who are catching hell. So that yes, I can understand you being down and out, but I don't want you to be so discouraged that we lose, lose a soldier for justice. You've been a soldier for well, as young as you are, a, few, a number of years, you know. So, 
but we don't, we don't want to lose a soldier just because you got some, some gangsters running unaccountable, you see. You see my point? You're not convinced, though, huh? Right. Oh, no, we have to put pressure on him to do that. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see what you... She's absolutely right. Oh, no, we right. need to put pressure on him to yeah, do we, that. We've got to constant, put constant pressure. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, my grandmother, who really was the, the bible wielding person in our family, would always tell us at night, uh, and she would read this scripture, do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. That was in the book of Galatians, uh, yes. chapter 6, verses 9. And often I think yes, that there are yes. people out there in society who think, well, you know what, I got away with it. I was able to, you know, uh, rack the system up and look what I did. But you know what? They're going to they, they, they reap what they sow. Yeah. And don't worry about when it will happen and how it will occur. But I, I, I just, I'm just a big believer that you reap what you sow. But at mm. the same time, don't grow weary. Because there are That's days, right. let me tell you something. I'm going right. to say it straight up. I was campaign manager for a campaign where I knew I got out the vote and I won that election. But the Supreme Court decided it. Mm. And I tell you one thing. As a child who got involved in the movement just so I can, I can make a difference, I, there were people who thought I would quit. And I said, oh, hell no. I now know what I have to do. Yeah. In addition to getting out the vote, I have to protect the right of all citizens to vote. Yeah. And so I'm yeah. still in the game because mm. I refuse, I refuse to get out. Now, had I got out the game, yeah, we never would have had a Barack Obama and Hillary run. I'm going to stay in the game until I get me a woman president, too. <laughs> I'm going to stay in the game until we get our first Latino president, our Asian Pacific American uh, president, a disabled president, openly gay and lesbian president, because I'm in the game. I'm in the game. And when you're in the game, you've got to stick, stick with it. Because sometimes when, when, when the darkest cloud comes on the horizon, you don't know what's on the other side of it. You just got to stay in the game, stay your ground, because it's it. going to pass, and you're going to still be standing. So That's believe, it. as long as you believe in justice and freedom, stay in your ground. Girl, you're going to have a good life, because oh, now you know Lord. I'm out here fighting with you. No, yes. No, no. Stay in your ground. That's it. That's what I wanted to say. That's exactly what I want. You said that so eloquently. Then <laughs> your ground. If, oh, if right. I might just ask one last question. Um, right. Thank you both for coming. It's been um, great listening to you guys. I'm um, eager to hear the um, prog progressive, not maybe solution, but approach to um, what I see as the civil rights issue of my, um, my peers' generation, which would be education. And so um, what does that... Um, Ms. Brazil, you say you stay in politics to pursue social justice and to pursue justice. What um, policies would you like, to, and Professor West also, would you like to see um, implemented to further that goal? Even the Bible and Proverbs say that if you teach your child, he will not stray. I mean, education to me is the, is the bedrock of a, of a strong and successful society and a bedrock of democracy. So for me, education, education, education. I go back to those principles my parents taught me and my grandparents reinforced that a good education, a good education would lead to opportunities and a passport. Right now on my little yellow paper, I'm writing one of my nephews. Oh yeah, you know, Auntie Donna, this texting thing. Mm -hmm. There are limitations to writing PPL and LOL and OMG and WTF. I write it longhand because I want him to read it, okay? <laughs> and I told my 21-year-old working at Applebee's, that's fine, but I want you to go to Delgado. You can work at Applebee's from 8 to 5, 6 to 9, you're going to Delgado, okay? That's what I believe. Now, we have to reinforce that. Society often tells us what they can and cannot do. but as a family, as a unit, as a society, we should reinforce this notion. 
that to win the future, we have to invest in education. I am, I am proud that this president did put the marker on education. Because mm -hmm. had he not protected Head Start, mm. see, I cannot sit there and look at George Will and smile. <laughs> I would have said something. But I said, I'm glad he protected it. See, that's a principle to me. Because right. oh, education is your passport to the future. I've been on college campuses now nonstop since I was 21 years old, 30 years. It brings me joy. It brings me joy teaching part-time. It brings me joy just being around people who are dedicated to educating the next generation. So this is your fight, and I hope you will help us continue to fight for education, not just at the federal level, but also here at the state and local level, where often the conversations about will we raise property taxes? Will we raise sales taxes to ensure that we keep our schools open? My God, I mean, I can't believe we're having these little narrow fights when we're spending $2.9 billion over in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, it's last a question, because I know. It's a matter of priority. We got, that was the last one? That was the last one. I'll just oh. say a quick word about this, though, because it's very important to keep in mind the number one country in the world. Oh. Students in science and math is Finland. Finland. Now, why is it Finland? 91% of the teachers are unionized, so it couldn't be the teachers' unions. That's very important. Couldn't be the teachers' unions, you see. What do they do in Finland? They have classrooms of 14 students. They have a teacher and a teacher's aide in every class. The teachers are paid some of the highest salaries so that the top graduates of their top universities become teachers rather than investment bankers. So when a teacher walks into the room, people have a sense of awe and say, these are the care teachers, caretakers of our precious children for the future. You see, there's a nobility in the calling. There's a magnanimity in the vocation. Now, in the United States, we're much further down the list, but our well-to-do students are on the same level as Finland, because they go to schools just like that too. Small rooms, teachers who care, parents involved, administrators visionary, and told every day or at least once a week, you're brilliant, whether it's true or not, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, you're brilliant. <laughs> Reinforce self-confidence, reinforce self-respect. That's what we need for our precious poor children. We need environment. So don't have to worry about bullets. Don't have to worry about not having enough food. Don't have to worry about not having enough touch and love and care. Where they have smalls, where they're told you can do it, have confidence in yourself. And then keep track of them from K through 12. There's a wonderful essay on this by Joanne Barkin in the recent issue of Dissent Magazine. Yeah. Isn't that a wonderful piece? That's a great piece. Five hundred billion dollars spent in K through twelve in the United States, but only four billion connected to the foundations that are driving things to privatize it and privatize it. You see, and and I, I don't I, I don't have a fetish about public or private. I believe in, in being flexible and looking for insights on both sides. But education is fundamental, but it has to do with making sure. The children are well fed, well cared for, and have a simple sense of self-confidence and are the center of attention and the teachers are elevated in their status and in their stature. But we want to thank Donna Brazil for coming oh, here. Oh, yes. Oh, my oh, dear sister. You, sir. Oh, thank you. Happy Easter. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And on Monday, there's a race and public policy conference right here at Princeton, and we invite all of you to come back. And also, we want to thank Jennifer Losey, our events coordinator, April Peters, our undergraduate administrator, Noliwe Rooks, and Carla Penn for making this event possible. Thank you, and we'll see you on Monday.